Well, good morning uh, in, in Hawaii. I'm sure it's other time zones for, for some of you in other places. But uh, as we say in Hawaii, you know, e komo mai, which is welcome to the Hawaiian Islands Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. And this is our talk story event that we hold monthly. And I'm Janet Covington. I'm the administrative liaison for HIAM. And I'm delighted to share this time with you and our very special guest speakers. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our very special guest speakers who refer to themselves as the Four Diamonds. Dr. Michelle Karume, Deepa Ram Souza, Dr. John Souza Jr., and Ulash Dunlop. All of our speakers today are MFTs and met in the AAMFT Leadership Symposium in 2018. Since then, they developed their Four Diamonds model of inclusive leadership out of a sense of responsibility and a need for more emphasis on systemic relationship and relational and inclusive approaches to leadership in the world of mental health and beyond. So without further delay, I will now hand it over to the Diamonds to tell you more about them and their approach. Aloha, Diamonds. Thank you. Aloha, namaste. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Hawaii Associate, for having us here. Uh, so who are the diamonds? Let's start by meeting Michelle. Born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, Dr. Michelle Karume is a, is a firstborn in a close-knit family. In her, her culture, it is assumed that the firstborn children take on leadership roles. So she followed suit. The arduous task as a child allowed her to learn about the importance of connecting with people. She completed her master's in the University, in University of Houston, Clear Lake, and her doctorate at Loma Linda University. In recent years, she has been holding the tension between being a leader in the MFT programs in Kenya and at the same time, learning how to be an inclusive leader. She enjoys trying new foods, spending time with her family, traveling, and connecting with the diamonds when possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce Deepa. She was born and raised in Guyana and currently lives in Hilo with her family. She's an East, East Indian descendant from the diaspora from India to Guyana. These transitions and migrations have greatly influenced her lifestyle and chosen profession paths and, and chosen professional paths. As a result, her journey has included deep exploration of the body through autopsies and necropsies of the mind through relational and systemic therapy and of the spirit through, in, through integral and interpersonal psychology. Deepa has integrated this passion for understanding from the core and the root into becoming an inclusive leader. She seeks to integrate her understanding of body, mind, spirit into affecting positive change in the world. This prompted her participation in the deepening of relationships in our leadership inclusive group. Ulash, why don't you go ahead and introduce John? Thank you, Sister Michelle. I'm going to introduce John. Uh, born in Honolulu, Hawaii, John has lived and traveled all over the world. As a child, John's frequent moves and broken home relationships left him at adept at joining with people in new places, but left him struggling to understand the how and the what of healthy long-term relationships. However, through his 15 years of training as an MFT and his 20-year relationship with his family of creation, John has learned the art and science of relationships, while also being aware of his individualistic epistemology as a Caucasian male from a Western culture. John currently resides in Hilo, Hawaii, where he enjoys sharing time with his wife and daughter, surfing and creating music under the pseudonym of the John Sir John. John. Yeah. Thanks, Ulash. Let me go ahead and get this uh, Prezi to you now. So I have the pleasure of introducing Ulash Dunlap, who was born and raised in London, United Kingdom, to, uh, let me get your picture up here. There we go, there you are. 
<laughs> to working class immigrant Asian Indian parents who fled Uganda in the 1970s for safety to London. As a child, Ulash knew she wanted to be in the field to support others. In London, she worked as a high school teacher in inner city high schools with low income students. Uh, Ulash moved to the United States 20 years ago. And as an immigrant and a woman of color, the importance of connections and having mentoring really helped Ulash to be where she is today as an individual who creates visibility and connection in different leadership roles by sitting on multiple local and national counseling psychology boards. Through her work, Ulash provides voices for underrepresented therapists and graduate students in our field through her local work as full-time faculty in a master's in counseling psychology program and as director of Di diversity, equity, and inclusion of the counseling program. So. Thank you, John. Thank you. So I hope you've gotten to get to know a little bit about us. Um, but before we get into the details of the model, we want to tell you our story on terms of how we met. So as Janet said, we met in um, 2018. And this was at the AAMFT Leadership Symposium, which at the time was in Seattle, Washington. I remember that day very clearly. I came in from Kenya. Um, jet lagged, didn't know anyone. And that evening we had um, uh, a welcome evening. Um, they had put together just a welcome, welcome section for us for everyone to come together. Um, and in that I met Ulash. Right, Michelle, you know, if you know me, I'm pretty social. So I think I got a drink and I sat, I just literally stood in the middle of the social hour by yeah. myself. And I'm like, I don't know anyone who is going to come to my little table. And it was beautiful. Michelle came and all of these people just came around. Yeah. Winning the conversation. Sure. It was so great. It was a meet and greet. That's what it was. But right. that was the night before. And then the conference started the very next morning. Mm -hmm. And so Deepa and, and okay, I, I can, yeah. walk into this huge hall with all of these tables and hundreds of people. And we're looking around thinking, okay, we don't want to sit at the table where it's all a bunch of white old folks. But on the other hand, we don't want to necessarily, you know, just introduce ourselves to a bunch of strangers. So we saw this one table right up front and there were these two lovely, friendly looking people sitting up there. Right. And actually what had happened, even just real quick, I forgot to mention is that it was the same experience for Ulash and I, even though we had briefly met the night before, you do walk into this room, tables filled and it was just like, okay, you know. So I think we both carrying breakfast just gravitated to the front. Um, and then, yeah, the both of you joined us, Deepa. And there's nothing wrong with uh, older folks or white folks, but for me, <laughs> um, you know, I needed some. I need to needed to sit somewhere where I felt kind of comfortable. So it was comforting to look at the beginning in the front of the room at that front table and to see people that um, reflected me a little bit. So I gave it a chance. I otherwise would have chosen in the back, in the corner, hidden and silenced. So yeah, I was happy yeah. to see these faces at that front table. So we went yeah. and we sat there. Great. And that is how we met. Who would have thought three years later, still well connected and have maintained our friendship. So this model that we want to introduce you to has four phases that we will each take you through. I will take you through the first phase, which is joining. Um, and so how, which is joining. So how do we develop inclusive leadership groups? That's the question we're trying to answer for you. So here's how, as we've met as a group and reflected on our own processes, uh, we realized that developing these groups is likened to the formation of a diamond. And so the diamond formation is the metaphor that we will use to demonstrate how to develop the inclusive leadership groups. So these four phases of our model are what we link um, to the diamond formation. So before I get into joining, let's watch a brief video on how a diamond is formed. Perfect. Let me pull that up for us here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this will work. 
Okay, can you all see this? White screen? Yes. All right. It's a short video, one minute, 57 seconds. And turn your speakers on, of course. Wow. Thank you, John. So let's start with joining. And just as we keep talking, think about um, the formation, the, 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 the metaphor that we're using in terms of diamonds um, as we put it into our model. So as therapists, we are familiar with the importance of joining in sessions. Similarly, Diamonds have a process of joining, better known as covalent bonding. And this is where the four, it, and at this point, there are four carbon atoms that come together in time, space, temperature, and pressure. So when we think about this phase, the joining phase, um, here's what joining is. It's the process of sharing, and if you just think even in terms of sessions, this is really the opening session where you're really getting to know that client or that individual. So it's the process of sharing. It's the process of attractive and repulsive forces. And this is where uh, we learned to be cohesive by having hard conversations, and, and we had to do that, and giving each other feedback on elements of self that would help us become better. So talking about, I mean, talk about being vulnerable this is the stage where we really had to start being vulnerable, which leads to the bonding. So in this process of joining, you will have the potential, you will have potential stressors. And in our group, um, our main stressor was fear. We recognized that there were several fears that we all had, even as we were interacting and doing all this work together. So fear was a big one for us. So we had fear of being vulnerable. Um, that's not always the easiest thing to do. So we had fear of being vulnerable. We had the fear of not belonging, fear of not of being judged. Um, I remember having the fear of not being understood. And so this whole process of understanding that privileging the relationship is really what helped us dissipate our fears. The space needed to be safe for us. And so we prioritized our space and our relationships. So let's move on to the next phase, which is deepening. Deepa, why don't you take us through that? Thank you, Michelle. So deepening is analogous to the quality determination phase of the diamond formation process, as we saw in the video. 
The greater the heat and pressure during covalent bonding, the greater the quality of the bond. The greater the quality of the bond determines the difference between a piece of diamond, which is hard, or a piece of graphite, which is soft. In our model, this was precisely the case. So as we increase pressure by getting to know each other more authentically, our bond strengthened. We went from being strangers to being trusted colleagues and friends. Therefore, we call the second phase deepening. So deepening is a process and a product. Through the process of consistent Zoom conversations, WhatsApp chats, regular random check-ins through texts or emails with each other, the natural byproduct became a very purposeful and rich relational bond. Without realizing our cohesion through the thousands of miles of separation, all the miles that separated us, brought us to a deeper understanding of ourselves as individuals, as family members, and as professionals in a larger social cultural system, as LMFTs. Our deepening process inadvertently invited each member to embrace and address these stressors that we're talking about. Right now I have a personal stressor because as I'm presenting, there's a garbage truck right outside my window. <laughs> timing, timing, can't write these things. <laughs> so the inter intrapersonal stressor that I have learned to overcome are things such as shyness and perceived fears of appearing incompetent or inadequate or unprepared. There are interpersonal stressors that are faced, such as busyness, having disagreements, sharing of vulnerabilities, and then social cultural stressors, such as different biases, different stereotypes, the effects of marginalization, and even uh, different values associated with diverse lifestyles and views and perspectives in the world. So in the deepening phase, these stressors were met with compassion, empathy, and collaboration in our group to the point of each of us becoming strengthened, literally deepening of our bond. As a result, each individual in this group has discovered and in other groups has the potential of discovering new resources towards inclusivity and leadership. How to belong to a group authentically, I would call it. So our group became a template for organizational and professional leadership, and we weren't even planning on it. But once this purpose and potential is born, where the diamond, the bond of the diamond is strengthened and the relational bond is strengthened, how does one maintain it? How do groups maintain it? How do relationships maintain it? For that, I'll hand you over to John. Awesome, thank you, Deepa. Yeah, so, you know, this deepening phase leads into this thing that has been a struggle for me all my life, which is this maintaining thing. Like, how do you maintain a relationship and how do you really craft that relationship and preserve it? Uh, so the diamond metaphor really lends itself well to this phase, because when we're talking about taking a diamond in the rough and turning it into this real amazing, beautiful diamond that could influence technology and cultures, uh, we have to look at the, the crafting process. And as you can see here, um, and as you saw in the video, the process of crafting a diamond requires creating a certain number of facets. And the cut uh, is either too deep or too shallow if it doesn't allow the light to be refracted back into the eye of the beholder. That's the whole idea behind this diamond and crafting it is we're trying to get this light. We're trying to see the light in each other and see the light in ourselves. Like that is the point of diversity. It brings out the best in all of us. When we have diverse ecologies, they are resistant to, uh, to drought and disease. And uh, we see this all over in nature. Diversity is just the key to resilience. So too, when we're shaping diamonds here, we wanna capture that light and bring out the best of all of us. So we craft this diamond with intentionality and with delicate precision which means we have to um, sometimes look at our strengths. We also have to look at where our growth areas are. And um, I would say that one of the key elements of this would be uh, learning how to do this with care. And so we have this process that we refer, refer to as clearings. And clearings, if 
you know, any, every therapist knows the, the general I statement. So uh, this is a variation of that, uh, but it's something that Dr. Karume offered to us that was really important in our own process as developing leaders uh, in an inclusive leadership group together was we got to a point where we, we had some issues that uh, we wanted to talk about, but we weren't sure how. And so Michelle said, hey, I have this thing I use with my clients called clearings. I think we should do that with each other. And it was beautiful. And we all took some time to consider what was it that we wanted to clear with each other. And over the course of several meetings, we engaged in these clearings. And it was a beautiful process that further strengthened our bond. Um, and so the clearing, which is just to express those feelings that might be blocking the relationship, can involve these four parts in a statement. Simply stated, when you, and then you describe some kind of specific concrete behavior, uh, I feel, and then you get to own your feelings, and then you say, I think, so you describe some sort of cognition around that, about that behavior, and then a request for something in the future. So it's actually really simple. Uh, it's not as easy to implement though. Um, so that's why we put it at this phase because you have to have some bonding to be able to go into this in a meaningful way, I think. So in addition to the clearings, you know, you've got to do um, some of the crap, the polishing. So you want to protect diamonds. Diamonds can hurt each other. They could chip each other if they're banging up on each other too much. So you want to be sure that um, you're, you're paying attention to how you're caring for your diamonds, how you're storing them. And similarly with our relationships with each other, we just want to pay attention to uh, how we're interacting with each other uh, on an ongoing basis. It, it never stops. You never stop paying attention to this. Um, but now the question often comes from people, especially in leadership groups, and especially when you start talking about administration, it's like, well, is the point of this just to talk about relationships? Well, yes. Um, and we understand that there are sometimes some practicalities that need to be addressed too. Like, what is the purpose of this group? Well, we offer the purpose of the group is primarily relationships, but Ulash, Ulash is going to share with us how other purpose can organically emerge from groups. Ulash. Thank you, Brother John. Thank you uh, for bringing in the maintaining piece, right? I, I, I believe and we believe, because I'm going to use I and we when we talk about influencing, right? That we are always influencing each other, especially when we are creating inclusive leadership groups. So firstly, let's get back to the diamond metaphor and then we'll unpack the, in, the influencing phase. So conductivity, when we look at diamonds, is the organic bond that has been created in the earlier stages. The diamond is a good conductor we know of heat because of that covalent bonding that's why it's so important right with the other phases we have to have the other phases sometimes to influence each other um, again when we think of diamonds as the final product with influencing it's a tool for relationships technology and power we know that each one of you and different countries have a different relationship to diamonds as a final final product Again, we believe that once there, we, there is joining, deepening and maintaining, people such as ourselves as leaders will feel much more comfortable not only sharing what's going on within, but what we are trying to create with inclusive leadership groups is then how do you as a leader, how can we influence you? How can we prop you so that you can go in outside as a leader and navigate uh, other systems? So we know this model is not a static model as my peers are sharing because we are always influencing each other. Sometimes we have to go back to joining, right? So for us, the way we, the four of us, the four diamonds have been influencing each other, which has had a huge effect on me and I know my peers, is that for us, we do have to join. Every two weeks since 2018, we get on Skype, Zoom to connect with each other because you have to have the other phases firstly before we can influence each other. Again, the way we've been influencing each other is that we have been supporting each other, for example, on work-life balance. We actually, the influencing part is we consult with each other on our professional needs, training ideas, guest lecturing, right? And we've been formulating these ideas to create this inclusive leadership group so that we can support ourselves as a group, but support you, other leaders in the community. 
What we've noticed is uh, the influence in part of this model. It's so essential because what you've probably noticed about the four of us, we have very different intersectional identities and we, we acknowledge that we hold privilege, but we are also in the non-target and target groups. And we have had some great conversations as a group that what is coming up for us, right, uh, in terms of our intersectional identities. For example, um, we've shared in our group with Brother John that, you know, we talk about, how does John as a white uh, cisgender male hold his privilege and then us free women of color we talk about well how does that look how are we going to navigate in our group so that we can move forward and create change outside so for me just to wrap up what I have learned from this group is the importance of having space from other people and practice the kind of key skills that we need so that we can go out in the world and use our verbal and non-verbal skills to be better leaders, to be better inclusive leaders in our communities. So I'm gonna pass it to Michelle. Thank you. Um, and even when I think, thank you so much, just um, listening to um, you talking, Ulash, and one of the things that I recognize is one of the things that I really took away in the processes as we've been researching and doing all this work is that people want to be seen. This element of joining is so important. It doesn't matter what professional level, um, government level, <laughs> um, at the core of it all, people want to be seen and understood. And, and that for me is, a big summary that I just took with me. Um, I'm curious to know what it was for um, you, jo John and Deepa. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I just love looking and listening to you all today. Wow, our, we have found something beautiful. Thank you for being a part of this journey with me. Mm -hmm. So during this process, um, as I'm sure you're all witnessing here, we each learn something amazing, both about ourselves and about each other. Um, I learned that the greater the pressure, the stronger the relational bond here, uh, without mm -hmm. a doubt. And so the stronger that relational bond, the, strong, the more we were able to bond and really show up authentically and build relationship the better were my abilities to tackle those stressors I talked about, including that garbage truck. And then I just took a deep breath and knew that my team had me mm. if I needed it. Um, so as a result, you know, I learned how to deeply self-reflect, how to hold heart-to-heart -heart connections with others because I had a place to come and practice with these, with these folks and to really embrace vulnerability and to show up authentically and, and to be seen and heard in larger settings. Now, I am an introvert. That is a huge accomplishment for me. Um, it also helped uh, for me to enter this journey with a really solid cultural foundation, which was provided by my family of origin, my family of creation, and of course my ancestors. So to them, I will also want to say thank you. You were very much a part of this lesson learned. Uh, I, personally, since I started this group, I felt uh, encouraged and motivated to start a doctorate program at CIIS, California Institute of Integral Studies, and I'm doing in, uh, transpersonal and integral psychology. And I even presented on imposter syndrome at one of their workshops. So that was terrifying, but I did it. And I learned something amazing because I'm a part of this group. So there are a lot of impossible tha uh, tasks and pathways before I feel um, this, before I felt this initiation with my peer here. I want to say thank you, Diamonds. I also know that my mom and dad are here, so I want to say thank you for being a part of this uh, lesson. I bring them along to my presentations because um, they are a part of the Diamonds. They're part of me, so thank you guys for being here. I want to say quick thanks to this organization, HIAM, for providing us an opportunity to share our little gem. So, John, what did you learn? Oh, boy. Um, uh, <laughs> well, one is I, I, our daughter is here, and she's, uh, you know, at going to school online right now. And so she just came out for breakfast, and she's asking, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? And, um, <laughs> so 
being aware of that and, and how wonderful it is to allow for those kinds of things like the garbage truck you're talking about. Like this is real life. And I, I love that we're able to have more real, more authentic conversations now. Um, while it's a drag to not be able to hang out in person as much, I'm really grateful for the authenticity that's being facilitated by these kinds of, um, this medium, this Zoom medium. Um, I found myself becoming quite emotional uh, when you were talking, Deepa, and when Sister Ulash uh, refers to me as brother, it, it really gives me a sense of belonging to the diamonds that um, I think as uh, a man from my cultural background is, is rare. And as I speak to a lot of other people who look like me, uh, I think it's rare for them too. And we're very lonely. And that's why I think there's a, a, a lot of um, probably a lot of suicide among people my age group and my demographic. Um, we're not raised to learn how to do relationships really well. We have to learn it on our own. And I'm really grateful to the Diamonds, to Deepa, to my family for teaching me about these things. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And I have to stop talking because I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> Ooh, Ash, did you, you got, yeah. Thank you, Brother John. You know, for me, as we, uh, we are developing not only our inclusive leadership group, but the Four Diamonds model, as we are taking this now to different individuals and different groups, what I've really learned, and I think Brother John has said it so well, and Sister Deepa, is that being vulnerable and authentic, we've got to have a space. I, sorry, I'm very collective, so I'm going to say I need space to be vulnerable and authentic. And I think, John, thank you. You really spoke to that piece. What I've learned so much is that we are influencing each other all the time as we are interacting in our four diamonds and as you uh, who are uh, uh, participating today are creating your own groups, we are always influencing each other. Having a space, an inclusive space where you can support each other's growth and challenges and to be receptive and to feedback, I think that is such a gift. If we are gonna be leaders, not just good leaders, transformative leaders, we need to have the space to grow. And so Four Diamonds or other leadership groups can really provide that. What I've learned is from this group, just to wrap up, that my imposter syndrome kicks in a lot and I get gaslighted a lot as a woman of color, as an immigrant on all my identity sketches. But where do I always come back to? I come back to the Four Diamonds group every two weeks where they hold and support me, they prop me up, they lift me up so that I can go back out in the world and be the leader I need to be so that I can walk alongside my colleagues, my peers and my community and the Four Diamonds supporting me. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, John, you, yep. So the lessons learned, is that the next? Yes. Um, so at this point, I'll just preface my part because I think you've already kind of talked about this element. Um, and so these rich backgrounds and experiences have contributed to what we knew, what we knew to be as leaders. However, through our research and our work on this model, we've come to learn that there are specific differences. And so for me, just the lessons that I have taken, you know, before it was just a summary I took away from the model and now focusing specifically is something that um, Dr. Souza talked about earlier, which is privileging the relationship. Um, and it's exactly what Ulash and Deepa have talked about. And how do you do that? It's been in our weekly leadership group meetings that really have become paramount um, to this group, which, and that element of being cohesive as well as being um, flexible. So where the traditional group would prioritize its purpose and or product, uh, we found that the more cohesive we were, the more accommodating of difference and similarities. And so we basically just flipped the traditional model of leadership or business development on its head by privileging the relationship. It wasn't easy, it's been a process, but we've learned to trust the process and that the product will organically emerge. 
So that's just um, the lessons that I took away. Thank you, Michelle. And the lesson I learned is just deepen the bond. Ask those questions. Dig in deep. Um, it's it's probably the most uncomfortable position in this model because um, I sometimes have to push, and sometimes I'm very uncomfortable doing that because I don't want to be that person. But sometimes we have to, and so we've all learned. In my my um, understanding. We've all learned how to take on each of these phases seamlessly and we're continuing to do so. So are we comfortable turning up the heat and increasing the pressure so we can have cohesion, so that there can be adaptability and there can be clear communication such as in the clearings we've talked about. So I say deepen the bond, increase the pressure, and if that means you need to hug it out, get to it. Well, after social distancing. John? Thanks, Deepa. Well, my challenge uh, has been to learn to be more authentic. Uh, and lately, I've really been appreciating the work of Gabor Mate, who's talked about the challenge between authenticity and attachment. And so I've really learned through this group, uh, these bonds have allowed me to be more authentic and in fact have increased the secure attachment that I have in my, in my sense of myself and in my connection with my peers and my friends here. Uh, authenticity allows for diversity in a given system. And as I've talked about before, diversity equals resilience. Um, and more importantly, owning our, our interdependence. I think this country, the United States, was founded on the Declaration of Independence and independence is an ideology that leaves many of us feeling isolated and alienated from one another. And so really allowing ourselves to feel interdependent and doing so with intentionality. Um, yeah, I think that's all I wanna say about that. Sister Ulash. Thank you, Brother John. What I really like about all these uh, phases, it, you know, it may not come in any order once you get in the flow, right? So influence in there, how do we influence each other in our group systemically and socially? What I really love is what this group has taught me is that we do have to privilege the relationship and be grounded in that. I love that. I love Sister Deepa saying, hey, we need to hug it out virtually. I love it. She brings me back again. She brings me back again to what? If I want to go influence, I need to deepen these bonds with my community, with people that I'm serving, that I'm supporting side by side. And I love um, the being authentic. I think that's really hard as a leader depending on where you are in your career, especially I work with a lot of emerging leaders. What does authenticity mean? I think when you have a space, a group to be able to do that, all these free things, I believe you will influence people in ways you won't even realize. So that is the four, I guess, diamonds model phase here. So to conclude, is that where we're going to now? Yep. Well, right. I mean, going going back to privileging the relationship, you know, Raul had commented, uh, meaning prioritizing the relationship over the task. So I don't know if someone could speak on that. Yeah, um, I'll just chime in here. I think like Michelle had talked about earlier, um, the privileging of the relationship is flipping the traditional business group uh, model on its head. Um, because we, we understand that there are projects to be completed or tasks to be completed, but a task without cohesion or strong relationships is just a job. And it won't have the same energy or success or a likelihood of success. Um, it might just be a short term gain situation. The, what we found in our group, uh, and please diamonds chime in here, is that through privileging our relationship first, 
this model came out organically and the book that we're working on came out organically and our presentations have all, all of that product or all the tasks that are associate, associated with these products emerged organically from us really focusing on connecting with each other and creating this inclusive uh, environment. Thank you, John. And what I would offer is, what are we without our relationships? And so what type of relationships should we have? Is it those weakened ones that are hanging by a, a single thread and then we're trying to be effective and create major positive changes in the world? Or ones where we can bond over adversity and challenges and struggles? So, you know, we have, we all have some foundation of those kinds of turmoils. So to take the risk of going deeper by talking about those things from a very heart-centered place, there's already the natural pathway of relational connection that can really take this to another level. So not just are we having our individual experiences, our own individual experiences can become the thing that bridges our differences and bring us closer together. How that translates to organizational inclusive leadership is different points of views brings further richness. There's major diversity and, and multiple point of views when addressing simple issues or, or, or complex issues. So the relational greetings is from Wazin. Like the thread. This is Mateo Slavon, CEO you all. of Wazin. Not sure what that is. Now let's check sound check. Let's check the sound. Let me. So do you hear me? <laughs> Please write uh, in the chat, write in comments, and please write English. Yeah. I think someone else oh, is having a uh, Zoom oh, meeting right. while they're attending this one. <laughs> so Rahul, did that uh, uh, answer your question? The, yeah, <laughs> I was gonna, okay. Thanks Rahul. Yeah, we now wanted to thank you for that. We just wanted to now open up the space. We wanted to share the model, but we wanted to open up now the space for any questions as you think about you know, your journey around inclusive leadership and being part of a group or starting a group. So I just wanted to share um, what an amazing model you have created and I am totally resonating with it. My heart has been opened by it. And it brings me so much excitement for the future because wow. haven't we all struggled with the challenges of this time and wanting to do something better and being scared and being um, overwhelmed and there's just so many huge emotions and how much better to do that together with a trusted community that loves us. So um, thank you so much for this beautiful metaphor. Oh my goodness, a diamond. And all the work that you've done um, individually and collectively. And I just honor your work and look forward so much to what you're gonna be doing with this. I would love to be a part of your group. I don't know that you're gonna ever expand your core, but I truly resonate so deeply with what you're saying. Thank you from the depth of my heart. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for that, Joy. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Joy. You are mm -hmm. a diamond. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just say something to Joy, you know, one of the things um, we found, even as we did this work, is that the challenges were the same, regardless of which part of the world. The fears were the same. When we looked at leaders and government and smaller community leaders, the challenges were the same. So it, it really is across the board where I think we can all say, yeah, this thing called leadership, we need to do it differently. It's no longer top down. I'm the boss and, you know, you do as I say, kind of, that's not working. So um, that really connected us. Um, in terms of how do we do this thing and really lead effectively. So, so thank you for gravitating towards that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joy. Yeah, thank you, Joy. 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 Thank you, Joy.
Thank you, Joy, and thank you all. Like what, 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 what my wish is, and hopefully, you know, our Diamond's wish is that how do you now go in, uh, outside now and create these great groups for yourself, like a space? You know, I'm speaking to a lot of agencies, like how can you as leaders or CEOs now craft this space for your leaders? Because this is part of your trainership, training and development. If you want to invest in good leadership, you have to now carve out space or give people space to be able to do it. So Joy, thank you for that. My pleasure. And I, if I may, sorry, if I may offer uh, LMFTs or LMFTs in training or LMFTs that have um, created this pathway for us. I see Mama Gaze here Joy's here, all of these beautiful pioneers that have laid this groundwork for us. This is the, uh, oh, uh, now I'm feeling teary-eyed. Thanks, John. You have laid a path for us and so many before you, and we are here to continue the work. So we choose to, oh man, here it comes, the waterworks. We choose to privilege relationships and systems because that is our training. And if the world is gonna become a better place, we do it through relationships, starting with ourselves. We started with, and then we continued with the four of us, and now we're extending it to you all. I want to acknowledge the people that came before us, our ancestors, you all here in this group that gave us that gift. Thank you. Um, it's my last day, but my name is Doris, and I wanted to just. I'm sorry, I don't have echo. echo. Oh. Uh, it's better now, I, I think. think. If somebody has a speaker on, that's probably causing the feedback. Oh, it means. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you now. You're good. Uh, just give me a minute. Sorry. That's it. Um, Sorry. Okay. Now I think I can hear you. I had put. So uh, I thank you for this. This has been really good. Um, I think when I was uh, listening to the model, uh, in fact, this just feels like class. Uh, Dr. Karume is my lecturer, is my supervisor lecturer. Um, <laughs> and I think I can even see a bunch of my classmates here and they can I guess even confirm that this feels like the way our class usually feels like. And those steps that um, you've talked about joining, um, joining, deepening, um, maintaining and influencing are the very same things that I, I believe Dr. Karume has taken our class through. And I feel as a cohort, and we are like, we are 13, those are the things that we feel that we experience as a cohort. They are here, they can either say yes or no. <laughs> uh, but that's how what I feel. Um, she would deep, uh, initially she would join by trying to us to talk about our, ourselves. And then um, depending by talking about, every class used to start with gratitude. So we would uh, basically have to deepen and know what's going on within each other's lives every week in class and then maintaining uh dr karuma used to insist on uh us finding out what's going on in the, uh, each other following up making sure this other person is okay should start the class and say how is this going or some version of that she made us we started even birth celebrating each other's birthdays she started a system for body system for the cohort that was coming. Like she, she created systems and led us in ways that we were maintaining that deepening. And now towards the end of even the, um, the program, yeah, we have a lot of influence from each other. I mean, get, I get a lot of support from my, my colleagues. Uh, we, we share, we send clients to one another mm -hmm. as in, um, so I can attest that truly this model does work, even just for training. Uh, I guess us who are going to be leaders, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. 
And yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I think even in that energy, I think is the energy we take to our clients in the, in the, yeah. in our, in, in, in uh, as we practice, I think, and just that sense of uh, goodness and kindness and love. Um, yeah. so it's nice to see it. I mean, even to see it with the four of you, it feels so nice. Um, it was worth staying up late for this. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you for a wonderful um a wonderful model and that it's just soulful. I feel it'll it it'll stand the test of time, just like the diamond. And so perfectly um the analogy of the diamond is just wonderful. So my hats off to you and uh my recognition for the person who I have seen uh demonstrated to me. Uh mm. as uh, uh, trainee. So, wow. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, Doris. Thank you. Doris. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um I just like to um pop in quickly and say a very big thank you for inviting me over. Um, to be able to listen to this amazing model and I particularly really liked the metaphor of it being a diamond and it's super relatable and more importantly I really liked um, I think the sense of togetherness that you guys emphasize on and it's really important to have that support system because when you've got a support system you're going to be able to be a better leader and to be able to serve better um, and so I think that is something that I really picked out from this talk, um, among so many other things. But I think that is something that really stood out for me, that sense of togetherness and being there for each other and um, having those very close relationships. And I think something that Deepa talked about was, you know, just reaching out and giving a hug. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just amazing. So thank you so much. Um, and it's, it's a phenomenal model. Well done. Thank you, Ashni. Good to see you. Thank you. And thank you to all the students who, who logged on. Um, I know it's also a school night for you. So really, thank you for, for attending. Yeah, thank you to the non-MFTs. I'm seeing you who come to um, learn in community with us. Yeah, I wanted to uh, thank you for the for the model and for the warm invitation. Uh, I really look forward to how you develop this um, from my vantage point or angle doing consulting work with organizations and wanting to bring a model of inclusive leadership to how leaders lead and how leaders build teams. And I could just uh, see a lot of reverberation um, and really looking forward to, uh, you know, as this get, as this continues to get refined or as, you know, as, as I know this was just a cursory presentation, but looking forward to um, how I might be able to apply this. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to quick offer, um, when we come into this model, it's almost as if we have to leave a bunch of preconceived notions outside. And I'm specifically talking about ones that subscribe to hierarchy and um, Western hegemony as in patriarchy and Eurocentrism. And it's very important that I actually say these words. And here's me deepening our group or attempting to, because those concepts and, and the model we're talking with, they can be in direct um, competition with each other. Building relationship requires hierarchy coming together on the same level playing field, being willing to look at what are my biases, like those interpersonal, interpersonal and social cultural stressors I talked about, being willing to look at those things that will limit my relational cohesion with members of group, family, organization, school, classrooms. Because if I come in with those preconceived notions, it puts barriers into my ability to deepen, to be vulnerable, and to really show up authentically. So 
as we are working with this model that's become so evident in my training at school in transpersonal psychology, can we go beyond personhood? Can we go beyond stereotypes and biases to really find heart-centered? Because when we look at the heart, we're identical. And so when we can cut to the core by squeezing all of that with pressure and, and compassion, we're going to find inclusivity. It's already naturally there awaiting. I just want to offer that there's a lens that needs to get wiped or taken off and a new one needs to be considered. That's what I'm learning. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for well, being it's the is it's the top of the hour now, and uh, we wanted to thank you all for attending from so many different parts of the world and so many time zones. And uh, again, if there are further questions or comments that you'd like to meet, make, please email them to us. I put our email address in the chat box, but we appreciate you all being here. Thank you to our speakers for taking your valuable time to share with us. And uh, you guys just stay safe and be happy. And we hope to cross paths again someday soon. Thank you, everybody. Aloha, Thank you all for coming. Aloha.